Um, if you have your copy of God's Word and you're not already there, I invite you to turn with me to Exodus 35. We're going from verse 1 to chapter 36, verse 7, as Pastor Stephen had read. Um, and it sounds familiar to us because we kind of just went through these sermons, didn't we? The Lord had already given this instruction to Moses. And so uh, what we're going to do this morning is kind of go ahead and get ready to apply this. Because um, we've already studied, you know, the Lord's instructions to, to the building of the tabernacle complex, what materials must be used, etc. But that was all before the great crime of the golden calf. And it felt like the deal was off, but the Lord showed mercy. And now the preparations are made to actually do the work under the leadership of Moses. How, how dreadfully dismal would it be for an architect to uh, do all the work and detail an entire house with no contractor to lead a team to actually build it? Just leave the blueprints on the shelf to collect dust. What a beautiful blueprint that is. Get that out again. I'd love to see that. But let's not actually do anything that it actually says. Let's just read it. On the human perspective of all of this, how sad would it be if we worked without the instruction of the Lord, without the blueprint, without any of the purpose? As many see themselves, they work and they work, just trying to make it through the week and enjoy a weekend but not work for the Lord, simply a joyless existence week in, week out until you die. There is, there is truth and goodness to our work. And there's wise instruction of the Lord, which gives clarity uh, to our work, our labor as worship here in this passage before us. So before we dig into the scripture together, let us pray for the Father's help. Heavenly Father, how precious your word is. How we come into an hour like this, our Bibles open on our laps, and just wanting to hear the instruction of the Lord, that we may meditate on it day and night, to find it so precious, that you would plant us like a tree behind living streams of water, and we drink it in our full. Lord, we... Come in thirsty for your righteousness, Lord. We pray that you would give us drink. Lord, that not only our minds would be instructed, but our hearts stirred, that we would love Christ. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would guide us through this text, that you would guide our minds, our hearts, as you give purpose to our labors, to your glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Moses assembled the congregation, the people, to work. He gathers them under his leadership to put the instructions of the Lord to the actual building of the tabernacle into practice. Moses gathers the people, and just before giving instruction about jobs, measurements, materials, everything that's going to be needed, he begins with the instructions on the fourth commandment. You will Sabbath rest. Six days, you will labor one day, you will not. Imagine a CEO of a very large company of, I don't know, 600,000 workers, because that's how what we're facing here. They gathers them together for a large company meeting, our favorite kind, the mandatory kind. He doesn't just begin with himself or the instructions about the labor or all of his new vision of what it's going to be for the coming year. But he said, instead spends his beginning remarks of how important it is for you to rest. Of course, the world offers great studies of how productive employees are when they rest well. Sure, that's part of it, but that's not all. God is merciful, and he loves his people. So rest, he says. But there is more than rest for our bodies here, isn't it? I, I like how Sinclair Ferguson describes Genesis 2, uh, the rest of God after crea creation to Adam, seeing the day as Father's Day. Of so Sabbath after Sabbath, this is the, my Father's Day. Each week, Adam was to see his dependence, but also his relationship with the Lord our God in resting on the Sabbath day, invited to rest as the Lord did. The Lord made the Sabbath for Adam. 
But Adam fell in the labors of the Lord, and instead of walking with God, he, di- he hid himself and covered himself. So we find here a renewal. This is a renewal of the Sabbath for these freed slaves revealed a different relationship that they have with their new king, Yahweh, as opposed to the cruel dictatorship of Pharaoh, which they have left behind. The laborers do not simply enjoy rest now, because they didn't rest under Pharaoh, but they rest as the Lord rested. To put it simply, to rest in the Lord. Now, as always, this points us to Christ who is superior to the law. He told we who labor and are heavy laden to come to him and and receive rest. He gives it. Not just rest in general, though. Don't think, well, he just gives rest. It's in general, however you want to define it. No, he says the rest is in him. Christ is our Sabbath rest, as Hebrews informs us. So if I am weary, I don't simply need earthly rest or try to define rest for myself. I need Christ. I need Christ who gives me rest. This orderly labor group that we find in Exodus 35, uh, of uh, this, this labor group that is assembled, that is a congregation to worship God, has a day of rest and times devoted to feasts or big meals that are meant to be enjoyed together before the face of the Lord. It isn't simply dreary labor. This is supposed to be a joyful people. Those are not, these are not weightless, meaningless rules that we see in Exodus 35, just being re, uh, you know, reiterated that it was already given to Moses. But these are commands followed by people who love the Lord their God. This is a far cry from the labors of Egypt. They worked in Egypt, and, but they worked for Pharaoh. No rest. Pharaoh didn't say, hey, um, every week, guys, so what I want you to do is come into the palace with me and rest with me. In fact, rest in me. I will give you rest. That is not how that worked. When Pharaoh commanded work, they worked, even if the work killed them. You go, you will not rest in fact, I'm tired of commanding my guys to go out and get straw for you. Now you have to go collect that for yourselves. This, this is Yahweh inviting us into his rest. The worshipful labors of Pharaoh was joined with hardship. And the worshipful labors of Yahweh was joined with rest. The worshipful labors of Yahweh is also feasts. We see this, and it's not necessarily reiterated, but this is part of, part of the plan. It's part of the instruction of the Lord that he gave to Moses when he was on top of the mountain. And it's somewhat of a return to Eden, where Adam worked the ground, but he didn't work by the sweat of his brow. He didn't work without rest, but he was joyfully walking with the Lord in the cool of the day. Yes, I say somewhat of a return to Eden but it's not fully. Yes, we somewhat return now as we rest and feast in the Lord Jesus Christ through our earthly days. Oh, but we wait for the Lord's return, entering his rest fully in him, tears wiped away, joy forever restored to our bodies and souls wearied from the labors and broken by sin and death in this world. Moses finishes the instructions of the Sabbath as something holy to be taken seriously. They must all honor the Sabbath as a community, and if someone steals the joyful rest of God's people, he must be put to death. So we are to take it seriously. And now the people are ready for Moses' leadership to build the house of God according to God's instruction. So he said, this is why it's important that he initiate, he begins this whole instruction with Sabbath rest. Don't forget why you're building. You'll forget if you do not rest on the Sabbath. You will forget the Lord's your God. So rest, but rest in Him. Um, This is an important thing to highlight. 
Moses' leadership was strong and that he led the people to faithfully hear and do the word of God. He didn't do things based on his own fancies and his opinion, nor did he consult Pharaoh's advisors at their best building practices. It was just like, well, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know if the Bible's enough. I better go back to Egypt, ask Pharaoh's guys, hey, how do you build pyramids? How do you do this, that, or the other thing? How do you read this? No, he simply took God's word to God's people, preached God's word, and then led according to God's word. It was as simple as that. We can become so obsessed in church strategy to building up the church. We can be obsessed, like, you know, I need to get the best marketing advice. We need to get the best this, best that, or the other thing. The world knows how to build a church. They seem to be really good at building things. Let's go ask them how do they do things. Instead, the old hymn, Trust and Obey, may well suit us better than all the best modern marketing strategies do their talking and their planning and their blueprinting. Would you say, just as a sake of introducing this next section, would you say that Israel, at this point in Exodus 35, as Moses has commanded the congregation to assemble, the word there is ecclesia in the Greek, it is the church. So you say he is assembling the church before him. Would you say that Israel was a healthy church at the base of this mountain? Would you say, man, they are, this is, this is spiritual awakening right here. This is, now think it through. Then what is a healthy church? Is, it big, is a healthy church's best marketing strategies, the most exciting, the things that go on, that those are the things that you need to be looking for when you're looking for a church. It is found in God. Is it found in a perfect leader? Well, Moses, was Moses perfect? Or did he rather disappoint at times? Is it found in the congregation itself and their excitements or their cultural relevance to the wilderness experience they're living in? Or would you say that a healthy church is found in a church that never sins? Because they grumbled. They did all the things that are very unattractive. And yet here they are, the base of this mountain. And God says, these are my people. This is a, the reason why I'm leading us here is what makes, what makes a church healthy. And what makes a people God's people is God. All the things that we come up with. There may be somewhat of good practical tips on how to do this and how to do that, but it is not the foundation of the church. The church's one foundation is Christ. And what makes us a healthy church is God with us. Mark Dever writes it this way, A healthy church is a church that continually strives to take God's side in the battle against the, the, the ungodly desires and deceits of the world, our flesh, and the devil. It's a church that continually seeks to conform itself to God's word. So again, it goes back to it. What did Moses do to be a good leader? He simply took the word of God, brought it down, assembled the people of God, preached to them God's word, and then as they labored, he brought in the word of God. So he said, this is my leadership, telling you who God is as he has explained himself. Faithful biblical preaching and teaching does the labor of building up the church in the healthy expectation of one another to be doers of the word and not hearers only. It would be a complete fallacy to see this as Moses preached a great sermon and then the congregation walks away and they don't do a single thing. They were commanded to be doers. What would it be like if the fabric makers and the goldsmiths did all their work, but that one guy who knew how to do all the acacia wood poles was like, well, Pastor Moses, I agree that God's word says that poles should be made, but I'd rather pay anyone else to do it, and I don't really feel like doing it myself. No, wise leadership, it keeps the people of God working in unity. So we're not to just hear the word and agree, but just as the Sabbath took a communal faithfulness in worshiping together, so must our labors, our labors to be encouraged to be done together to the glory of God. And wisdom and leadership is a good quality for Moses to have. Oh, don't, don't, just, don't just completely dismiss the leadershipy stuff. He is a good leader. But 
um, the task that the Lord had gave Moses required skilled people. It was just like, well, you need to build this. I don't really know, Moses, how you're going to do that. The Lord didn't just instruct and then, then walk away like, well, I, w- I, want to, I want to know how Moses accomplishes this. No, the Lord filled his people with a spirit of different skills to work together. Again, God is doing all the work. Look at me in now uh, chapter 35, verse 10. He says, uh, let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that Yahweh has commanded. Come, every skilled craftsman. Sometimes, if we're really honest, truly honest with the Lord, our skills in our own minds seem not as important as others. Uh, I imagine myself walking around this wilderness massive labor camp, passing goldsmiths. Now, imagine if you've ever seen a goldsmith work, it's very intricate work. These goldsmiths were probably skilled, uh, not just filled by the Lord, but skilled by actually putting it to practice back in Egypt. He passed the carpenters. You ever watch a carpenter work? They, They measure things out. It's not just chopping wood, it's, it's fashioning wood. And, and workers in fine linen, people putting linen together, and it's like, wow. Right down to the, you know, probably the end of the camp, near the acacia wood guys, there's that one guy who makes nails, right? He's on the edge, you're like, wow, I imagine he is going through his existence going, you know, I, my whole job is to make something that's going to be hidden. You know, that's it. This is what I do. I make nails. But even those, you say, well, those are important jobs. This is really getting the work of the Lord accomplished. Because every one of them will come to the end of their craft and say, look upon their finished work with beaming pride as the Levites use the poles that the carpenters made, and Aaron wearing skillfully crafted breastplate worked by jewelers, Yahweh himself dwelling in a tent worked by the workers of fine linen. And be the one guy on the outskirts going, everybody's like, hey, what, what's your skill? Um, I chop down trees. <laughs> That's it. That's all I do. I go in and I Go collect trees, bring it. Or the guy that brings in stones. What do you do? Well, I go down to the creek, I pick up a rock, and I bring it to the camp, and then I turn around and I go get another one. Um, day in, day out, and then, then there's the Sabbath rest for me too. And that's the one time I see the community, but you know, mine's not nearly as important as others. I want you to think of yourself as... You think, well, mine's not really that important. I, I do a job, I guess. I mean, I'm thankful that it pays the bills and pays for my family to eat. And What wonders do you think Moses' staff could perform if it wasn't sent by Yahweh? It'd just be a, a wooden stick. He could touch Rivers and lakes and red seas with it, it doesn't do anything. You know, the water stays water. It doesn't divide. Remember, Yahweh told Moses to touch the Red Sea with his stick. And the wonders of Moses' labors was not found in the stick. It wasn't found in the applause of men. It wasn't found in anything on earth. It was found in the mighty work of God. His hand was in this. Has the Lord sent us and promised to go with us? Then why do I doubt that I will make it to the end? Why do I doubt that I'm going to endure when it's Him at work in me? And then why do I doubt that my labors on earth have any eternal significance? Why do I doubt these things? What are they? Well, I just got up today, I did a thing, and then I went home, and it was no big deal. It's what everybody else does. No, it's not what everybody else does. Uh, Look at me in verses 20 through 21. 
Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him, and every one whose spirit moved him, and brought Yahweh's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. Now just hear the response of this congregation of Moses' sermon. They left Moses. They listened to the word of God as spoken through Moses, and they immediately left and got to work. Everyone in the assembly of God's people were all working together, and their loving and gracious God giving them a Sabbath. Six days you shall labor, one day you shall rest. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but God in his graciousness made the Sabbath for man, as Jesus said. God gave us each skill. He gave us each workplaces. He's given us each rest. And when a church family encourages one another, not simply to emotionally cope with the hardships of life, but in the labors commanded by the Lord in all the one another passages, every individual follower of Jesus Christ will assemble with the willing and ready skills to joyfully serve the Lord in our service to one another. But the, Lord, the word of the Lord pierce the hearts of the people to use the skill that the Holy Spirit provided to worship God as hearers and doers of the word. In essence, the people didn't build the house of God. They listened and obeyed, but God is the one who commanded it. God is the one who gave them the skills. God gave them all jobs. He set the measurements. He gave the details about the materials and the artistry. And even today, in essence, we don't build the church. We simply listen and obey. But God commanded it. God gives us the desires. He gives us the skills. Now, you see, again, I want to read 21 again, but with 22. They came, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought Yahweh's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart, brought, uh, how do you pronounce that? Oh, bridges. Okay. And here, earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to Yahweh. That's the trouble of doing a lot of my study in the NASB and then preaching from the ESV. But the, the, the people who gave up gold jewelry for Aaron to melt down and make an idol, she catches this, don't, don't miss this, and now joyfully giving up their gold for the Lord. The Word of God says that their hearts stirred inside of them. What changed? What changed in the hearts of people that were before demanding a golden calf to be made by the gold that they were collecting? Now they're collecting gold and their hearts are stirred and they want to give, they want to worship. The, the, the Word of God stirred in the hearts of His people and the Spirit moved in each man and woman to give. They had hearts which stirred to be willing hearts. We think, oh, I'm just going to be on my own willpower. I need to be more faithful to the Lord, so I'm just going to whip myself into shape. And that's not how this worked. A forgiving and gracious God of great mercy has forgiven his people of a great sin. And what they once collected gold for is now to the Lord. And what made them willing? Their hearts were stirred. Their hearts, however, weren't just stirred to give, but to work. In, in the first part of verse 26, it says, All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And then down to um, chapter 36, verse 2, Moses called uh, Bezalel and Oholiab. Oh and every craftsman in whose mind Yahweh had put skill. Again, Yahweh put the skill in them. Everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. The God who alone can give new hearts doesn't just give us a heart which joyfully gives, but joyfully works. Yeah, we, we live in a post-Genesis 3 world, don't we? We work by the sweat of our brow, and we'd rather not. And so we put this investment in, well, I hate work, 
when re- really, you just hate the fact that work is by the sweat of our brow. I like work. Idle hands really does not lead me to any kind of significant joy. And yet, I can look at my work and say, because it, it wears me out. It's not really worth my joy and my time and my heart being stirred. How did, how did these Israelites work so gladly? I mean, really, you're in a wilderness and you're building things in a desert. And just, wow, how, did they be, how are they so happy in their work? The Holy Spirit gave them a heart stirred to work and to give. Forgiveness and restoration of this people to God, by God, was no minor task. Yet our gracious and merciful God didn't just forgive their idolatry. So if you're reading that, you say, well, God just forgave them, and then they just like, you know what? We should return to Him, thanks. Well, yes, but that was because He stirred their hearts. He forgave their idolatry, and He forgives and loves them. He restored them to joyfully labor and give in the worship of God who dwells in their midst. Allow me, allow me to encourage your heart, beloved. Do you remember Yahweh's sermon to Moses as his glory passed by? Yahweh, Yahweh, God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving sin, transgression, and iniquity. God forgave Israel. He forgives and he loves you. He has given you rest and work, but this is all for his glory. So I ask you, do you love your job? If anyone out there in the world would ask you, do you love your job? As a pastor, I hear a lot of talk thinking my job somehow is spiritual work as opposed to others. That's nonsense. Let me tell you why. All of you have spiritual work in your labors. It's not like God is confined to this building or my office or me. He has called each of us to where we are. So, all of you have a sacred task before the face of God. The Lord doesn't applaud me louder than He does you. He intentionally made my position to be dependent upon you, that we depend upon each other in the Lord together, resting together, worshiping together, laboring together, yes, even feasting together when we take the Lord's Supper. God did not save and show mercy to these Israelites so they can labor on and work through the wilderness all glum and hating their their work. They might as well have returned back to Egypt if that is what God has delivered them to. Beloved, God did not save you, justify you before him through the Lord Jesus Christ in order for you to meander through this, this life, work day after work day, work week after work week with a soured heart. If we take the commands of the Lord to holy character seriously, then let us equally take his commands to rejoice seriously. Your job, no matter the earthly value or the applause of men, whether you are paid well or not paid at all, is a gift of God. There is dignity because there is eternal dignity in our labors on this earth. Work isn't a product of the fall, beloved, but was commanded by a working God to Adam before the fall. And we are invited into his labors, who by his spirit stirs our hearts, just as we have been invited to rest by his spirit. And this people grumbled, much of the way here at the base of this mountain, didn't they? You say, well, I don't know if God's going to be gracious with me because, you know, to be honest with you, Pastor, I grumbled before I even got here. And I was grumbling all week, and I really don't know if he's going to stir my heart like you're suggesting. He stirred the hearts of a people that grumbled, accused God of bringing them to the wilderness to die, and then when they got really impatient at the base of a mountain of thunder and great shock and awe, even though they were provided for by God to go out and collect manna, they still gathered themselves together and worshipped an idol. If God can forgive Israel, what do you think he will do for you? He's a forgiving God. He's a gracious God. But he doesn't just forgive you. He stirs our hearts. Stirs our hearts to the labor and to do so joyfully. To give, not just to give with glum, but we give joyfully. 
Your work is sacred work, beloved. So rejoice in your work as worship to our worship, merciful and gracious God. Whether you're the guy who gets to work on the acacia wood poles that the Levites carry, or you're the guy out, out in the wilderness collecting creek rock and bringing it to camp. You are doing sacred work. Now, you, when you think of our work here in the church, which is mostly voluntary, it is also sacred work. Just as they were nail makers, artisans, there were still men who carried stuff and brought material back to the work camp. And before the face of Yahweh, there is no such thing as a small or a large task. They're just tasks. Tasks dedicated to the Lord. The all-seeing eyes of Christ looks upon your labors. He sees everything. Think about what you do for a living. What human lives are impacted by what you do? Whether you receive praise or not, let your, heart, let your hearts be stirred and willing by His Holy Spirit to work for the glory of God. We are tools in the hands of His very good creation. You see, say, but I work out there, pastor. I don't do the spiritual work of a pastor. That's baloney. Okay? You go out, you do something in the world, you impact people's lives, you are talking to people, you are doing things that make the world go round. God has given you a skill, He's given you a task, He's given you your job, and He stirs your heart to the work. So know that you're not just working for the world or for your boss. Our inter- eternal significance is this in mind, that we work for the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, pack that down a little. The, wor- the Lord has a joyful heart. And from a joyful heart commands us to joyfully labor and rest and feast before Him. Your job and your labors have eternal significance in this. They are acts of worship to an eternally worthy God of our worship. So when your heart does not feel stirred and it doesn't feel willing, can I just tell you, ask Him. When you're tempted to grumble, when you're tempted to despair in your work, or just, you know, today is really not going as planned No grumbling is a heart issue and not a circumstance issue. And there's good news. God stirs hearts. When tempted to think your job is not sacred work, remember the benefits of the Lord and do not forget them. When tempted to not give to the Lord, remember He stirs our hearts and invites us into the work of His church. And we come finally to chapter 36, verse 6. So Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution of the sanctuary. And I read that out of context for a reason. If you read that just on there, you're like, wow, that's an interesting command, but why did Moses give the command? They were giving too much. They were working too much. They brought in more material than they needed. They cut more trees than they needed. They brought more stones than needed. They made more nails than it was needed. They fashioned more gold than it was needed. Oh, how, where did this all come from? The Holy Spirit stirred the people's hearts so much, Moses had to tell them to stop it. Stop giving. You're doing too much. Imagine with all of this joyful work that there was no Sabbath like they were back in Pharaoh's command. I wonder if they'd be so joyful that they would want to just keep working too. I don't want a Sabbath. I want to keep working. In fact, I can't wait till the sermon's over because I'd really like to get back to the things that I want to do instead of resting in the Lord. And they would. But our gracious God, who gives us rest and joy in our labors, our sacred tasks, are made acceptable to God, whose joy is our strength. So understand this, beloved. It is important to rest. Moses could lead the people to work and complete the task of building the tabernacle according to the instruction of the Lord. But human hands cannot build God's house, nor can Moses prepare a place for us to live with God in a house not built by human hands. All this is pointing us forward. Christ said in John 14, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
prepared a place in the house of God that's not built by human hands. Christ prepares it. What must we do to build God's house? Well, this house cannot be built by human hands. But in Jesus Christ, who is God with us, He dwells in our midst. He sends us His Holy Spirit to give us new hearts, which are stirred and joyful in our labors and in our rests. Hearts stirred to worship. What must we do to secure a place for myself in the Father's house? This is, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do to get God's attention. Hey, pay attention to me. Look at me. I'm doing better things than others. I need to go through some more religious hoops. Let not your hearts be troubled. Christ secures a room for his people. He has secured a place. And when Christ secures a place, we can be assured. Well, how? How does Christ prepare a place for me? Did he not say this before he went to the cross? He went past altars made by human hands, willingly our sa- a sacrifice, and as our great high priest, he is a better mediator than Moses. Who Moses, who came before the face of Yahweh, said, perhaps I can make atonement for my people, could not. But what Moses could not accomplish, Jesus did. And he, as our perfect sacrifice, guarantees a return to Eden, to be with the presence of the Lord forever, not hindered by sin, darkness, death, wiping away tears from our face personally as a touch to our face for the last time. And when Jesus says, I prepare a place for you in my Father's house, which has many rooms, it is guaranteed. So do not let your hearts be troubled. That is the that is the crux of that message that Jesus gave. Do not, be, do not get anxious. Do not grow weary in doing good work. For Jesus himself has made ready the place in the house of God for you. Does the room in the house of God, not built by human hands, need more of my earthly labors? Maybe I need to whip myself into more shape because I'm afraid I'm going to lose that place. No, you are not. You didn't prepare it. You don't lose it. Does your coming enjoyment of fellowship with God, meeting with you like he did with Moses as a friend, somehow greatly hindered by you? No, because Christ prepares it. So if you have faith in Christ, you have a place in the Father's house. What the tabernacle and the tent of meeting could not accomplish has been accomplished perfectly by Jesus Christ. Christ is prepared, made ready, a place for each of his people, preparing many rooms.